Okay, so we've done two things already today. We did a quick review of a few diploma questions because I need you guys to uh, – eventually. I don't need you to know it now, but I need you to be more comfortable with the words oxidizing agents, reducing agents, and knowing who gets reduced. Like all that vocabulary needs to sink in. But please do not freak out if you're like, oh, my goodness, which one is which? Like it, I still need to talk it through every single time. Okay, who's losing electrons? Okay, if you're losing electrons, that means you're being oxidized. If you're being oxidized, that means you are the reducing agent. Like every time, I literally have to do that. Okay, so that was the first thing. We talked a lot about vocabulary. And then now that we've looked at kind of our lab here, I think we're ready to talk more in detail about this table. And so I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm actually just going to read right off my slides here because I think I've got these points in a good order. We talked about redox reactions. A redox reaction involves two things, right? It involves reduction and oxidation. There cannot be a Daniel and me $10 relationship without both of us being here, right? I have to give him $10. He has to receive it. You have to have both, right? And so that's why we have the gained and lost part. And over time, you'll hopefully be able to tell me which one is which. Electrons are gained by the oxidizing agent. Let's review why. If electrons are being gained, that's grr. Gain of electrons is reduction. But whoever is reduced is the oxidizing agent. It's like opposites. And then if electrons are lost, loss of electrons is oxidation. But whoever gets oxidized is the reducing agent. I'm not good at English. But you guys know the words um, verb and noun? You guys know those words a little bit? Like an action word versus like a person, place, or thing? You guys are somewhat nodding at me. You're like, oh, great, I have English this afternoon too. Getting it now as well. Okay. In terms of like English words, reduction is a verb. To be reduced is an action. But the oxidizing agent is the noun we give to it. So like when I talk about an oxidizing agent or a reducing agent, that is like the person, place, or thing. In this example, I guess it's a thing. Right? So a noun is an oxidizing agent. Whereas reduce is an action. Does that help at all? It'll sink in. Okay, this is the, to the topic I want to have here. Think of it as a tug of war, some sort of fight. Okay. If someone's having electrons being given or taken away, there's kind of a fight for it. And in the example I've given so far, Daniel just always takes my money. Except I've never actually given him money, but it's always hypothetical. One day. One day I'll actually give him 10 bucks. <laughs> He has to beat me in uh, uh, Smash Bros. or something like that. <laughs> okay, so here's the terminology we're using then. If one entity is actually able to pull electrons away, the word we use is spontaneous reaction. Okay, If Daniel is actually able to take my money from me, or if fluorine is actually able to take copper's electrons, we call that spontaneous. It means the reaction actually occurs. But there are many reactions where nothing happens at all. And we were able to see that, hopefully, here, is that some of those metals left in the solution, they did nothing. You know? And so when copper came knocking, saying, come give me your electrons, they said no. That happens in chemistry. The biggest reason why is probably this term here. That's, that's more or less the concept behind it, right? Is, well, who has more of a desire for electrons? We've already learned this word, right? Electronegativity. Eh, no, I'll go through them in order, I guess. Okay, so here's an example of a picture of something we already just kind of did. Let's say we took copper ions and we put them in zinc with zinc metal. This is one of the ones we have in the back there, right? What should happen is your copper 2 plus ions are going to reduce into copper solid. This was blue, and as it reduces, it should hopefully turn more of a clear color. Now, this was reduction. I'm going to put an R in front of it to indicate reduction. Reduction should involve the gain of electrons. So one thing we might write is that we need to gain some electrons. See how by writing it on the left-hand side, this kind of indicates an endothermic reaction where you need to absorb electrons. But well, where does copper get its electrons from? It's not like there's like an electron I don't know, store that you can just go buy electrons at. It actually has to go steal it from somebody. 
So that's the oxidation part, and that's where the zinc metal comes in. Zinc metal, what did zinc metal turn into? Zinc 2 plus. So it kind of went the opposite way. This guy went from an ion into a metal. This guy's going to go from a metal into an ion. And then in doing so, if this guy goes from a metal state to an ion state, see how this guy went from a charge of 0 to a charge of plus 2? How do you go from 0 to plus 2? What has to happen? You'd have to lose electrons. So to show the loss of two electrons, I put them on this side over here. This is known as a reduction half reaction. This is known as an oxidation half reaction. And if we use Hess's law to kind of combine them together, we end up with our net redox reaction, which would have been this. Copper 2 plus, in an aqueous format, would have reacted with some solid zinc. So that's this guy and this guy combining together. It would have then turned into some copper solid, which didn't we see evidence of that as I passed around the beakers? You know, like some coating. That's like a black or a burgundy red, you know. And then we also would have seen some zinc ions. Well, actually, we never would have seen the zinc ions, though, because they're probably clear in colors. Where did the electrons go? Well, think Hess's law. Yeah, they cancel. There's two on this side and two on this side. Doesn't that cancel? That's actually why I have to teach thermochem before electrochem. Because I think it, it makes sense now that you've learned Hess's law, the idea that if you have something on this side, something on this side, they can cancel. So this is now known as a redox equation, where there was a fight. Zinc gave away its electrons. Copper stole them. And it actually occurred. So sometimes what we might do is over top of the arrow, you know how we sometimes write a catalyst over the arrow? You might also see either, uh, well, you usually you don't write anything if it does occur. If for whatever reason it doesn't occur, you might write NS for non-spontaneous. That would only be if the reaction actually does not actually occur, though. But since this one occurred, we probably would just leave it. I mean, essentially, here's what happened, and like another way of picturing this. Somebody loses electrons and is oxidized. Its electrons get transferred to the other species, which gets reduced, and then we can write out some example equations. This is the one that I literally just wrote the zinc and copper one. If it helps to get started right now, you may find it useful to write this somewhere in your data booklet. Your reducing agent gets oxidized. What's the acronym for oxidize? LEO. Oxidize means loss of electrons. So your reducing agent will always lose an electron. Who will then take the electron? The oxidizing agent. This is me, this is Daniel. How am I doing? Does this make sense? I think I need to hop ahead. I'm going to skip now. I don't know. I'm just kind of gauging reaction here. I think I'm going to hop ahead and I'm going to try an example of doing something because I've been talking about theory now for a while. Let me find something we can do here. Okay, let's fi find this page here. I know it's way further in the future. Let's try this one here. And let's try to make some predictions. Good science should really lead to a scenario where you're now able to, once you've learned a few things, you should be able to make a prediction about what will happen in the future. And if you've done well, your prediction should become accurate. All right, so let's make a prediction. What if I were to take some liquid bromine and add it to some iron 2 nitrate? Let's try to figure out what would happen. Can you guys find the slide? Interesting. Okay, let's see. It is, uh, do you have this slide? Yeah. You have this slide. Okay. And do you have this slide? Sometimes you will be given seven redox reactions. Yeah. But you literally don't have the slide between it. Weird. Okay. Um, let okay, me write it down with a pencil, I guess, somewhere. Grab a back of a sheet of paper somewhere. I'll give you a second to write here, I guess, then. State whether the following compounds will react. That's all I'm asking for. Will these things react with each other? I'm not even asking you to tell me what they're going to make. We can do that. 
I'm just tell, trying to ask you, will they be spontaneous? Will there be a winner in this fight? This is called rape. Does that make sense? Because if I were to all of a sudden just keep going, they'd all be frantically writing it down. So I have to stop and pause for a second. Plows right through. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't have any good stories. Phoenix has a lot of stories. Once you guys have written these down, what I need you to do is make sure you have your, um, your that table open that I've been showing you for the last little while. And um, probably use a pencil lightly because you're probably going to be erasing and going in here lots. Because we're going to use this table a ton to try to predict things. Until you get better at finding things on that table, like I'm pretty good at knowing where to look because I have you know years of experience. You guys have looked at it for a day. You're probably going to want to do a lot of circling of the species, the items you have on your table there. So here's what we're looking to do once you guys get to this point. On that table, here's what I want you to do. Find BR2 and circle it. On that table, I'm going to flip back in a second here, but here's the table on the next slide here. Find BR2 liquid, wherever it is. It's right there. And circle it. I'll flip back to the slide here. We're also going to want to try to find Fe and NO3. Now, here's one of the issues, though. This is an ionic compound. Do you guys remember from the literally the first thing I would have taught you back in Chem 20? Ionic compounds in water can dissociate. So we can really consider this to be an Fe2 plus that's aqueous. And we can also consider this to be two NO3s that are aqueous. So here's, what, here's my task for you. Find and circle bromine liquid. Find and circle Fe2 plus, and find and circle any NO3s you have in the data booklet. So I think everybody's done, almost done writing these down. I'm going to flip the page in a second here, though. So bromine liquid's up here. We're also looking for Fe2 plus. It's like a word search. I'll help you out. There is an Fe2 plus right here. I kind of look for perspective. There's an Fe2 plus right there. There is also a second Fe2 plus down there. You guys able to find those ones? There are no more Fe2 pluses on the table, by the way. There's just two of them. Anybody know why there's one on both sides? I haven't fully explained this table yet. It's because one can reduce and one can also oxidize. Yeah, because it can either go from a 3 plus to a 2 plus, or it can go from a 2 plus down to a 0. It actually is capable of both going up and down. Okay, the last thing we had to look for was nitrate ions. And there are nitrate ions on the table in a few spots. There's one right about here. You can see that one. And I think that might actually be it. I think what else is on this version? That's it. Okay, so here's what we're looking for. We are looking for an entire reaction where somebody up on this side over here, remember how these guys right here are being reduced? Literally, we call it a reduction table. Things on this side of the table are oxidizing agents. And if you'd like to, you can probably label your table as so. These are all oxidizing agents. Everybody on this side over here actually happens to be a reducing agent. And the way your table works, Sam, you used this word earlier. You were really strong when you resisted Daniel's attempt to steal your money. Right. And so we would actually say that the strongest oxidizing agent is at the very top. And as you go down, you get weaker and weaker and weaker. So the strongest oxidizing agent we know is fluorine. What does an oxidizing agent want to do? Well, it wants to reduce. And what does reduction mean? What reduction means is that you want to gain electrons. Long story short, 
If someone wants to gain electrons, they want to steal electrons from somebody. So your strongest oxidizing agent, fluorine, is the best thief we have. Does that make sense? Fluorine's a great thief. Fluorine steals electrons. Well, the way it actually works for reducing agents is reducing agents are on the other half of the table. And your strongest reducing agent actually happens to be down here, at the bottom right here. Lithium is actually the strongest reducing agent we know. And it actually goes the opposite way. Let me explain why. What does a reducing agent do? Okay, well, a reducing agent is a noun. What it does is a reducing agent oxidizes. And um, what does oxidize mean? Well, oxidize means it loses electrons. Does lithium want electrons? No. Lithium would actually very much like to get rid of its one valence electron, right? Doesn't everybody in group one and group two on your periodic table, don't they all have either one or two valence electrons? Wouldn't they love to get rid of them and become ions? So your lithium solid right here, it is your strongest reducing agent going up. The way this table basically works is that if you can find a downhill trajectory, which I've already shown you, like, for example, from here to here, you can make a spontaneous reaction because you have somebody right here who is a strong oxidizing agent, and you have somebody down here who is lower than it in the rankings, and it can steal its electrons. Can this iron right here react with that one right there, though? The answer is no, because it's like that would be like this number six seed beating the number one seed. Okay, I know that happens like in real life, but in chemistry, the one seed always beats the two seed, which should always beat the seven seed. Right. Shh, don't stop talking about the Patriots here. That hurts still. Um, don't um, don't change off the slide you're on, but I'm going to find a slide I had further back here. It basically works like this. When you have your table, if you have a downhill trajectory, when you're looking for things, it's a spontaneous reaction. But if you have a, yeah, that's what I have right here. If you have a downhill tra trajectory, like from here down to here, you have a reaction that can take place. Whereas if it goes kind of the other way, and it goes actually uphill, I really should change my arrows on this slide here. Then it's not. Uh, long story short, I guess, the question that I just asked you earlier was, will a spontaneous reaction take place? What's the answer? Yeah. What will bromine liquid do? Bromine liquid is going to turn into two bromine ions. So in a way, you have to look at your table like this. This bromine liquid is going to turn into two bromine ions. So if I wanted to continue this right here, I would say this bromine liquid turned into two bromine negatives. That's what's going to happen to it. So this bromine liquid will steal some electrons and turn into bromine negative right here. Where's it getting the electrons from? It doesn't just pull them out of thin air. It steals them from this iron right here. What is this iron 2 plus going to turn into? Well, it actually goes like backwards the other way. If one goes like this and takes electrons, then this one right here has to give electrons. And so this iron 3 plus or 2 plus right here is actually going to go to iron 3 plus. Sorry if it's a little bit blurry here. Let me erase that. This right here was my iron 2 plus, which I had circled. What's going to happen is this iron 2 plus is actually going to lose an electron and we're going to make the arrow go like in a reverse method, it's going to lose one electron and become iron 3 plus. So what's going to happen here is your iron is then going to also turn into an iron 3 plus. Iron 2 plus will turn into iron 3 plus. And this we would call a spontaneous reaction because it is sufficient to take place. It will occur. All right, one example down. I don't expect you to get it after one example. Can I do a few more? I'm going to speed up a little bit, though, because it's... I'm going slow, but that's okay. Let's try the next one. I need for you guys to, on the table, so I guess erase the old ones that you had on there. You're going to do a lot of erasing. I need you to find a copper, again, a nitrate, and a gold. Now, the copper you're looking for, though, has to be copper 2+. plus. Is that clear why it has to be copper 2+. plus? Let me write it not yellow, because yellow sucks. This copper has to be copper 2 plus, 
because of the fact that it's an ionic compound. You also want to have nitrate with a negative, and you want to have gold solid. So, erase. Where is copper 2 plus? Right there. Anybody find where solid gold is? It's like way up at the top, up there. That's where the solid gold is. See that? Uh, nitrate, by the way, is right here. Do we have a downhill trajectory? No. Because here's what's going to happen. Copper wants to steal some electrons. Right? Literally, read this from left to right. Copper needs to find two electrons. Copper's a bully. Copper didn't bring enough money for lunch. Needs two more dollars. And so he's going to go around. He's going to try to pick on kids and say, give me two dollars. Give me two dollars. Give me two dollars. And you know who Copper managed to find? Copper came across gold and said to gold, gold, I want two dollars. Well, here's the problem. Copper's this big. And gold is, yeah. And so Copper comes across gold, who's in like the number four ranking in the world ranking of wanting electrons, and said, gold, I want you to go backwards and give me three electrons. And Gold says, puny little copper, no. Does that make sense? Right. So if you ever have an uphill trajectory, nothing happens. But if you ever have a downhill trajectory, then you do have a spontaneous reaction. Does that make sense? So the answer to this one right here is state whether or not they will react. You, you might put an arrow on top. You might put like an NS maybe over top and say, there's a non-spontaneous reaction here. This reaction won't happen. As much as copper would love to try to react with gold, it won't. Now, we just did this lab like earlier today. Does copper react with many other things, though? Yeah. Right? Like, for example, if copper was searching around for someone to bully, if copper came across iron, or if copper came across calcium, or if iron came across zinc, would it be able to steal their lunch money? Yeah. It just so happens that in this reaction, uh, copper was with gold, and that wasn't helpful. Does that make sense? Let's try another one. All right, what we're looking for now, by the way, you know how I always say states of matter matter? This really applies to this unit here, too. You always have to consider whether you are circling the solid gold side or the aqueous gold side, because it makes a difference as to which one you have. Okay, make sure you circle the right side on there as well. Let's try another one here. I've got FeCl3. Okay, this is ionic dissociated. This means you need to have iron 3 plus, because right, that'll be the type of iron you have, as an aqueous ion. And you're also going to need to have chlorine minus as an aqueous ion. And then you're also going to want to look for copper solid. Those are the three things you're looking for. Iron 3 plus in the aqueous format, chlorine negative in the aqueous format, and copper solid. Find them and circle them. And don't worry if it takes you a long time at first, okay? But over time, I promise you will know exactly where to look for copper because you'll have done it a few times. So let me give you a hand here if you haven't found them. Here's copper solid, more or less right in the middle of the table. Copper solid's right here. Uh, to help you guys out, I'm going to start using the numbers that are associated with them. This one's positive 0.34. Okay. We'll talk about what those numbers mean eventually, but we're not ready for that. Uh, if you're looking for chlorine negative, there's a chlorine negative up here at 136 in the positives. And uh, what was the other thing we had? We had iron 3 plus, right? Where is iron 3 plus? Iron 3 plus is right here at 0 0.77. You guys find those ones there? We'll respond to oh. um, chlorine negative. Oh, I get what you're saying, because there's also like one sitting up there. Is that what you're meaning? Yeah. Um, can I talk about that in one second? I was going to get to that. You've, you've beaten me to something I was going to point out. Remind me of this if I don't come back to it. There's also one right here as well, by the way. 
Actually, you know what? I should talk about it now. How do you know which one to use? In order for the reaction to take place, you have to have everything on that side. Let's look at this one right here. In order for this one to work, you'd have to have chlorine ions, but you'd also have to have some hydroxide. Based on what I've told you here, do we have hydroxides? Okay. Then you don't have enough for this reaction to take place, unfortunately. Does that make sense? So that actually rules out this one right here because you don't actually have the hydroxide sitting right there. So do you have just chlorine by itself? Well, yeah. I mean, it literally said that. What about the one above it, though? Do you have chlorine plus water? Do you have water in this solution? Yeah. Because how do I know we have water? I said it was aqueous. What does aqueous mean? It means it's dissolved in water. So in theory, actually, you do have what you need right here, because you do actually possess the water needed to make that one react. Here's the issue, though. Can Fe react with that chlorine anyways? Well, no, because isn't this one higher up on the list anyways? And if it wanted to, could it react with that one up there? Well, no, it's still non-spontaneous. But you know what this one can react with this is, though? Is the copper. Does that make sense? Because in terms of our bully system here, these are going to go away from this in chemistry saying, Mr. Schalk taught us all about how to bully things. But in terms of like our thief system here, iron is not capable, iron 3 plus is not capable of stealing electrons from these guys up here. The, this is like a, a first grader. This is like a seventh grader trying to beat up a grade 12 kid. Not happening. But this is like a seventh grader picking on a fifth grader. That one can happen. Does that make sense? So in order to finish this off, I often draw some arrows here. Like you're going to make a mess of this table. What's going to happen to your iron 3 plus? It is going to add an electron. And by virtue of it adding an electron, it's going to turn into iron 2 plus. So now I know what it's going to turn into. It's going to produce some iron 2 plus. Let me go back to that table here again. My iron 3 plus will gain an electron and turn into iron 2 plus. Where did it get its electron from, though? Well, from copper. Copper is going to go reverse. These guys right here, they're not going to go in reverse because they're too strong, right? Going in reverse is a bit, essentially my analogy of giving up your money. If going this way to the right is taking money, going to the left is giving up money. So will these guys up here want to go backwards and give up their money? No, they're too strong. But will this copper down here say uncle and give up its money? Yeah, it will. So copper is going to give up two electrons and turn itself into copper 2 plus. So that'll be our other product. Our other product will be copper 2 plus. So now I can make a prediction of what's going to happen. The Fe3 plus is going to go to Fe2 plus, whereas the copper solid is going to go to copper 2 plus. Let's talk about how the electrons work here. If you go from 3 plus to 2 plus, what happened? Did you gain or lose electrons? gained an electron. If you go from 0 to 2 plus, you must have lost electrons. It does kind of come full circle. Ah, good question. What does happen to the chlorine? What do we call it? A yeah, spectator out. Because it didn't do anything. Yeah, good question. You look like you have a question. You make a great point here. You're also a little ahead of me here. One of the things we're always going to have to make sure we do is balance. And so you can actually see in terms of this equation, as I've written it here, this may not be balanced necessarily correctly. And so that whole 1 to 2 ratio, I'm going to cover in a bit, though. But yeah, balancing is going to be important, because you can't have someone gain one electron, someone else gain two. So why don't I do that properly here? If this guy gained one electron, and this one lost two electrons, it's probably going to involve having some twos in front of the iron here. So that now, if it goes from 3 down to 2, if there's 2 of them, now it gains 2 electrons. And if we put 1s right here, from 0 to 2 with 1 of them, then it lost 2 electrons. I'll, I'll cover that later, though. That actually is literally our next topic, is writing and balancing redox reactions. But I'm glad you noticed that. 
Okay, let's try another example. This is one of those things where I think I just need to do a ton of examples, and the more I do, the better it'll hopefully sink in. This next one here is almost the exact same. Almost the exact same, with one subtle difference. What's the difference? Yeah, we need to use an Fe2 plus and our chlorine negatives with our copper solids. Again, states of matter matter. There is a difference between an iron 2 plus an iron 3 plus and an iron solid. It makes a difference. So the good news is, is hopefully I've trained you guys well for this time, because I've always said that sort of right the states of matter. Here we go. Uh, copper solid is still right where we left it. And uh, chlorine is still kind of sitting right where we left it. But now we have iron 2 plus to work with. Where's iron 2 plus? Uh, there's one way down here. There's also one way up here. So I'll pause for a second so you guys can try to find those yourselves. Can you find a spontaneous reaction here? Oh, there's not a bully situation that can work here. Iron 2 plus would love to try to turn to iron solid, right? If you approach it from this perspective, this guy is going to try to find two electrons and turn into iron solid. But it can't just go to the bank and take out two electrons. It literally has to steal it from somebody else. This is like a, a net sum game where if someone goes up, someone has to go down. Right. Well, in terms of our ranking system, iron is capable of stealing, but only from somebody down here. here. Do we have somebody down there that it can steal from? Not that I noticed. It can try to steal from up here, but like that would be like a, a fifth grader coming after you guys and saying, give me your lunch money. It's not going to happen, right? Okay, I want to point out one more thing here. This is actually what we believe happened yesterday in our lab. Remember how the uh, calcium reaction um, kind of kind of got away from us a little bit there and uh, started bubbling over? Here's what we intended to have happen. I want to show you what we intended to have happen. And here's what we believe did happen. We combined some copper 2 plus and some calcium. And we were expecting to see the copper 2 plus turn into solid copper, become less blue, and have the calcium turn into some calcium ions. That's what we were expecting to have happen. But you know how when we made the copper solution, it was made in water? Water is on this table in a few different locations, including right here. You see how liquid water is on the table right there? Now, liquid water does not react with many things. Like liquid water will not react with solid cadmium or tin or lead or mercury, right? But there is actually a spontaneous reaction that can take place between liquid water and uh, calcium. And you know what it ends up producing? Liquid water ends up producing hydrogen gas. You know how it was bubbling? That's why I was sudden freaked out, because my two thoughts were, here's my thought process. It's boiling. Really weird as to why it's boiling. And I was a little perplexed. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, what if it's not boiling? What if it's hydrogen gas? And if it's hydrogen gas, what can happen to hydrogen gas if it's exothermic enough and we overcome that activation energy? And since it wasn't in the fume hood, that's why all of a sudden it was like, get back. Because I realized it could be hydrogen gas. And then I knew it for sure because when I put phenolphthalein on it, the other thing it produces is hydroxide. And what does phenolphthalein do in the presence of a base? It turns pink. And so that's why I'm fairly certain that's what happened. Now, we were surprised by this because it's not what should have happened. In terms of should have happened, it always is supposed to go in the order of strongest down to weakest. And so our strongest should have been reacting with the weakest down here. It should not have gone water before calcium. It actually should have gone copper first, which is why we were a little perplexed. But it may have been just because we didn't use enough copper because the solution was pretty pale. But I think that can actually help explain the scenario yesterday. And hopefully you can kind of understand my panic all of a sudden there where I was like, shoot, if that's hydrogen, we're in trouble. So does that make sense? Fortunately, I, I think it actually was better. I said this to Melissa last night when I spilled it. I think that actually was best for it because then what ended up happening is rather than all of the uh, hydrogen being like concentrated at the top of the beaker there, as soon as I spilled it, it would have had been, had been able to dissipate better, and that actually might have actually been a good thing. So anyways. Thank you, Darian. <laughs> well, because I, I did have that blow up. Like you guys in grade 12 heard that happen with the sodium last year, right? So like it, it could have been bad. Thank goodness.
Because you guys heard that bang from Lab's Glossary, right? Yeah. Well, so last year, you guys know how I put sodium in uh, the water there, and it, like, fizzled a little bit there? I put too much sodium in, and it literally caused it, the, the beaker to, like, shatter and explode in all different directions. The good news is we were under the fume hood, so any glass wouldn't have been shrapnel. But, like, essentially, like, it was kind of like a mini bomb, right? Except, like, well, I know, you laugh because we're safe. You don't laugh when it happens to you. Um, but like, like the, the the glass would have shattered in 360 degrees, and you might have had shards of glass basically embedded in you. That wouldn't have been good. So thank goodness nothing bad happened. We'll never speak of it again. All right. Let me go through this slide right here now, because I'm running out of time here. I got to pick her up a little bit. Here's kind of your process for how you solve this. You're going to be given different reactions, and we got to figure out what happens. You guys still with me? <laughs> Too much excitement from the uh, from the hydrogen producing reaction. Okay, here's what you do. If you're given some different reactions, you have to use your redox table. The idea is you need to identify your oxidizing agents and reducing agents, and then if the reaction is going to be spontaneous, the OA is above the RA. What that really means is that the reaction goes with a downhill trajectory. Whereas if the reaction is not spontaneous, it goes with an uphill trajectory. Okay. That's how you can figure out basically whether a reaction is going to take place or not. Downhill versus uphill. We're going to practice this a lot, okay? This is not like we're done with this concept here. But I'd like to show you an example of a diploma question that I need to prep you for because they ask one of these every year. It's right here. Well, actually, let's do the actual diploma one. Do you guys have this one, though? Okay, let's do the one before it then. Okay. You want another one? Did you actually look? Okay, let's do the actual one off the diploma first because I'm running out of time. Okay. So this is off of an actual diploma from back, you know, a few years ago. This is something I need you guys to be able to handle. Okay. Now here's one of the things they're going to do. They might throw elements at you that are pretend elements or that are really obscure ones. Like, for example, when do we ever use uranium? or yttrium, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, So since these ones are not in our data booklet, the, the question is basically asking you to piece together your own table. Here's how this would look. If U3 plus reacts with LAS, I actually know a little bit about how my table is going to work. It means that U3 plus needs to be above LAS. It needs to be like in a downhill trajectory. That's what I interpret out of this. If U3 plus and, what is LA? Lanth How do I say it again? Lanthium? Lanthanide? Yeah, no, that's a thing. We never use it, right? Anyways, if uranium and LA <laughs> are going to react in this orientation, then it has to be downhill. Does that part make sense? And now I'm going to fill in the rest. What did U3 plus turn into? Well, it turned into US. Because what happened to it? It got reduced. What happened to your LA solid? Well, it went backwards and turned into LA3+, it looks like. This first line, that's what this tells me. If U3 plus and LA solid do react, it means U3 plus must be downhill, like must go in a downhill trajectory to get there. And now I know what the other two things would have been, because this one would have gone this way, this would have gone this way. And to write it out here, this guy would have picked up three electrons to get to there, but this guy would have given away three electrons to go back. Second line. It says that Y3 plus and U solid do not react. Okay, I've already labeled where U solid is, right? U solid is right here. If Y3 plus does not react with it, I'm going to tell you where it's not. I cannot put Y3 plus up here. Does that make sense? That's not where it can go, because if I did put it up here, it would have reacted with U solid. Does that make sense? So it means that either Y3 plus was there or there. 
Make sense? Because from here, that would have been a non-spontaneous reaction. Or even right there, it would have been a non-spontaneous reaction. How am I going to figure it out? Well, let's use the third reaction. Y3 plus does react with LA solid. So if I put my Y3 plus right here, does this Y3 plus react with the LA solid like that? Oh, no. So by default, the way this puzzle gets solved is that the Y3 plus must have gone there. And now I'm going to fill out the rest. What does Y3 plus turn into? Well, Y3 plus, when it reacts with something, turns into Y solid. So, okay, over here, there's a Y solid right here. And for that to happen, it probably needs three electrons. Let's try it one more time from the top, make sure everything kind of makes sense. Is U3 plus above LA solid? Is U3 plus above LA solid? Yes. Is Y3 plus below U solid? Is Y3 plus below U solid? Is Y3 plus though above LA? Y3 plus is above LA. Now for the final step. This asks us to take the oxidizing agents listed from strongest to weakest. What is an oxidizing agent? Well, an oxidizing agent is a noun. What is the thing that the oxidizing agent does? It reduces. What does reduction mean? Reduction means to gain electrons. Is this side gaining electrons or this side gaining electrons? Uh, this side right here, isn't this guy gaining an electron? Because these guys over here, they're actually going like backwards. This guy is going to turn into this and lose electrons. So these now are the things that were gaining electrons. And we need to rank them in order of strength. Well, how do we rank them according to strength? You're number one, king of the ring. You're number two, second best. You're number three, the weakling. So in terms of ranking, it should have gone U3+. plus followed by Y3+, plus, and then LA3+. Plus. The answer is B. Okay, I know I did all that work. First question, can you follow it? Okay, harder question, can you do it by yourself, like with some practice eventually? Because okay, we're not quite ready yet. You guys want to try one more and then call it a day? Do I have time? I have time. One more? You'll have to write this one out. Well, actually, no, you can do this one right here. You have this one here, right? I know it's not a diploma question, but it's the exact same concept. Why don't I try one more with you? All right, so let's try this. It says that CO2 plus and IN solid, so cobalt and indium, is spontaneous. So I can write that with the downhill trajectory. I'm going to take my CO2 pluses, and I'm going to write them above the IN solids. I'm going to write them with the downhill trajectory because I know that it does react. Is cobalt a big enough bully to steal from indium? Yeah. What's cobalt going to turn into? Well, it literally tells me, right? Doesn't cobalt turn into cobalt solid? So I'll put that one there. All right, now, how does cobalt 2 plus turn into cobalt solid? Well, the reason why it's able to do that is because it gained two electrons. Well, where did it get its electrons from? Well, it stole them. Like, literally, it is a thief. Who did it steal the electrons from? From indium. So indium, I I'm actually going to write the arrow backwards almost. I'm going to say, well, indium must have turned backwards into IN3+. Plus. And I know it's IN3+, plus because doesn't it literally tell me that's what it turned into? So this IN solid, it actually goes backwards into IN3+. Plus. Uh, your data booklet, by the way, writes these with double-sided arrows. If I haven't pointed that out yet to people, it often writes them with an arrow going both ways because you can think of it going forward as reduction or backwards as oxidation. How many electrons, though, does indium give up? Three, right? Wouldn't it have to be three for there to be from a zero to a three? Now, hang on. Doesn't that explain why we have to have balances with threes and twos here, though? Because what they had to do is they had to like take this reaction and times it by 3, because if you take this and times by 3, you have 6. And if you take this and times by 2, you also have 6. So I'm going to talk about balancing another day, though. That's, that's more than I want to chew off in one class. You, you do have to balance. 
the questions on. Literally, that's that's what I got from line one. This whole first line told me where these two things go. Now I want to do copper. It says that copper 2 plus and cobalt solid also react. I'm going to write copper 2 plus just right here. And I'm going to move it with my pen. Currently, is copper 2 plus in a place where it's spontaneous with cobalt solid? Well, no, that's uphill. What if I moved it into this ranking slot? Would then the copper 2 plus be spontaneous with cobalt solid? Okay, so that means it has to be up there, I guess. So I'm going to... Uh, Smart words are awesome. There we go. So now we know that copper must be actually the new king of the ring. Now copper is spontaneous with cobalt. I just got to fill up the rest of the table here. Well, what is copper going to turn into from a 2 plus? Well, it turns into copper solid. And the only reason it can do that is because it picks up two electrons. There, I've now ranked my next one. Now our last one. It says that uh, copper 2 plus and palladium do not react. Now I already have copper 2 plus on my table, so I'm going to write out a PD solid. And I'm going to put it in a few different spots. We'll see where, where it so we'll see where is logical. If I put it down here, copper 2 plus and PD solid, that would be spontaneous. So here doesn't work. There doesn't work. There doesn't work. It must have gone there. Does that make sense? So slide everybody down. Now, we kind of have to use our best common sense and figure out, well, what would have palladium turned into? I think it's going to be PD2+. plus. I think it's got a 2-plus charge with two electrons, but I would have to look that up. What is its charge? PD? PD. Yeah, 2-plus is first. It's probably the one it would be. So there, we've now made ourselves a table. If I were to ask you to tell me the strongest oxidizing agent... That would be this guy right here. If I were to ask you to tell me the weakest oxidizing agent, that would be this guy right here. I'll even write them out. This is the strongest oxidizing agent. This is the weakest oxidizing agent. If I asked you for the strongest reducing agent, that would be here. If I asked you for the weakest reducing agent, that would be right there. What you want in order to have a reaction is a strong oxidizing agent react with a strong reducing agent. Because the reason why they're strong is this guy really wants to steal electrons, and this guy really wants to give them away. It's match made. It's perfect, right? He wants $10. I want to give it to him. Go ahead. Take it. The way that doesn't work is if it tries to go this way. This guy right here, as an oxidizing agent, does not want to give away electrons. And this guy up here does not really want to take them. So you know what ends up happening? Nothing. I think we need to call it there before we take off. Any questions? Okay, one last passing thought, I guess. It takes a little while for this to sink in, okay? Please do not freak out if you're like, wow. Okay? We're only just kind of working our way into Electrochem. I think you need to do at least five topics before it finally, like, comes full circle and you kind of get it all. Because I have to skip little bits, bits, bits and pieces here and there, so it's not overwhelming. So tomorrow, why don't we, I don't want to do anything new tomorrow. Tomorrow, why don't you guys start looking at some of the questions on your lab and get a little bit of practice doing things like labeling oxidizing agents, reducing agents. That'll be a good Friday activity. Sound good? Sure. They say yes. Okay, we'll see you guys later. <laughs>